Welcome and thanks for joining us for today's webinar on network design and best practices. I'm Ricky Pishoff and I'm one of the technical training managers at SnapAV and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Before we get started, a few quick housekeeping items. First, we will be recording the presentation as usual and we'll send you a copy by email within the next few days. The email will also include uh, the coupon code that was mentioned in the invite letter. And lastly, we are planning to have time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. So please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the webinar. You can do that by using the question and answer feature in the webinar control panel. Okay, now I'd like to do, introduce today's presenter, Aham Eric Susi, who is the product category uh, manager for our Arachnus networking products. Aham, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Ricky. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for attending uh, this afternoon on the East Coast and uh, noon time on the West Coast. Uh, so today we have a very uh, general topic. Uh, it's about network design and best practices. Um, we we got a lot of feedback from dealers um, asking us, hey, when it comes to designing a new networking job, what are the best things or best approach uh, or best practices that we need to take in, into consideration uh, from an architectural standpoint uh, all the way to some tips and tricks. Um, so that's what we will cover uh, in this webinar. Um, it won't take more than I think 30 minutes uh, and we'll, we'll have probably about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for some Q&A. Um, so what we will cover this webinar is that how to break down a network design so you have a really good networking uh, opportunity with your customer. Uh, how can you uh, design it? How can you think about that design uh, to break down the solution uh, in your head and get come up with a really uh, solid architecture? Um, and second to that, you know, what, what kind of conversation you need to have with your customer? Uh, what kind of input that you need to get from that customer um, in order to get to that really good approach? Um, before we end the presentation, we have some exciting new product announcement uh, uh, for you, so stay tuned for us. Uh, something very excited about, and we'll end up with some Q&A. Um, thanks for a, a lot of your feedback when you signed up uh, for the webinar. I got uh, to read all of the respondents' uh, uh, answers around, you know, what kind of pain points you have today. Uh, I did see a lot of uh, topics or pain points that we covered in previous webinars. So please check uh, those webinars, particularly those three. Uh, they are either on YouTube or Vimeo. Um, so there's the Sonos VLANs and switches webinar we did last year. So we talked about how to do VLAN setup and uh, deal with Sonos setups um, and, and all that fun stuff. And then we did uh, fast roaming when we announced the 500, 700 access points, explaining how we want, how we deal with fast roaming on the access points themselves. And uh, I believe last month we did the truth about Wi-Fi speeds um, just to level set on what you should expect in the real world uh, in terms of Wi-Fi speeds and how to level set that conversation with your customers. Um, so today I will not uh, dive into the details of each or one of these three items. Uh, you, I'll leave it for you guys to go and uh, uh, kind of rewatch those webinars and, and brush up on that information. And we have a lot of content online in the product support tab as well. Um, so like I said, today is all about the architecture. Uh, so how can you design? Um, how can you design a new uh, networking job? How can you think about it from an architecture perspective and I want to you know introduce something like um, it's really a building block mindset if you want to have a really solid architecture no matter how big or small the job it needs to be scalable and it needs to be modular um, so I'll introduce kind of like a framework to think about um, for you guys uh, so we start with the ISP uh, so this is an ISP building block um, so it starts with what you're getting in that house or what you're getting in that small business is it you know a is a Spectrum service, is a Comcast service, is a Verizon service. Each service provider will have its own nuances that you need to deal with in your region. Um, what kind of uh, line is coming into the job? Is it a cable? Is it a fiber? Is it, it uh, you know, DSL? Uh, so that's you know, one important external factor 
um, that is out of somewhat out of your control, uh, but you need to be very aware of in terms of the design and the setup, because it will affect. This is the pipe that is going into the the network. The second building block is your gateway. Uh, so this is your router, um, and you need to make sure that it is specced properly. Uh, the following building block is the core, then the access, then the devices. So the devices are the edge devices that will interface with the network. Uh, so these are your mobile phones, these are your tablets, these are your control systems, your VoIP phones. Uh, so this is what the end customer will interface with and will utilize. And this is how the traffic flows from top to bottom. So it goes from the ISP to the gateway, to the core, to the access, to the end devices. But also this is how the devices communicate with each other. So they go from devices to access to devices, or devices core to devices, or devices gateway to devices. And that all depends on you know, what kind of setup, how big the network is, if you have VLANs or not. So these, these, this is the framework that we would like to establish in your uh, mindset uh, when you start designing. And this is how it translates to a typical uh, traffic path. So if you think about it, you know, traffic coming to the internet or from the internet, uh, it goes through typically a modem. And that's usually a third party modem from, from the ISP. Um, then goes to the gateway, which is a router, then goes to a core, which is a core switch, then goes to an access uh, layer, which is either an access switch or in case of Wi-Fi, we have access points. Uh, and then that interface with the end devices. Um, so this is these are the this this is the framework and this is how uh, we should dissect the network. So let's take an example of you know a what well, I say it's a typical network uh, job that you deal with on average. So it's on average we see uh, from our customers that they will have between 50 to 100 devices on a typical network. So this starts with a lot of end devices. So those devices would be you know control touch panels. A a lot of IP cameras and MVR, uh, a couple of printers, a couple of desktops, um, some Sonos or some you know wireless uh, streaming uh, service, a lot of entertainment, uh, TVs as well. You get a lot of personal equipment like laptops, smartphones, and tablets. Um, we see now, in, and I'm guilty as charged, it's like every individual in the household will have at least two of these three, if not all three or more. Uh, so you can you'll be surprised on how many devices on a typical network would be. And I see on average, it's between 50 and 70. Um, so this is a typical job, and this is the devices layer or devices block that is here. So here's how you wanna, you know, if somebody, you know, you sat down with the customer and say, it's like, I got, I need all of these things in a new job. Um, and you start to dissect this network. So you start with the internet, so you know it's coming through a cable modem. Um, and now you got this cable modem that plugs into our 300 series router, then you got a 210 PoE switch, then that 210 PoE switch as a core switch connects to a lot of access network devices, includes PoE switches or unmanaged switches or access points. Um, so from an architecture standpoint, this is what we call hub and spot architecture or a router and a stick architecture. Uh, so the switch is the center point, the core switch, uh, and this is a scalable architecture because now this eight port switch can connect up to eight access devices. So if you have eight switches or eight access points or a combination of both, you can get up to eight. Uh, but let's say you know the house or the network expanded, they installed three or four uh, TV locations uh, in the future, uh, and now you are you know you're bottlenecked by the number of ports on that switch. All you have to do is come back to the job, swap this core switch with a 16 or a 24 port switch, and now you, you can expand your access layer uh, to more than, to, to about 24 access switches or access devices. So this is how, how you can scale this architecture um, because you are bounded by the number of ports on that core switch. Uh, so same goes into those edge switches. Uh, so let's say we have you know an eight port here, uh, an eight PoE switch port. Uh, then you connect up to eight cameras to it. 
Um, so you're powering eight PoE cameras from this eight PoE switch. And two years down the line, the customer comes back and say, hey, I want to install a couple of cameras um, in the front or in the back of the house. And, and you go, you say, right, you know, I have only, I populated all my ports on this access switch. Uh, so, Mr. Customer, in order for me to expand these cameras, I need to expand the PoE ports on that switch. So, all I, I have to do is swap the 8 port with a 16 port. Uh, and this way, it's one component change in the network that expands your, your doubles the capacity of your IP cameras. So, I will go... Uh, uh, next layer by layer or block by block and see uh, and, and share with you guys um, some of the tips and tricks for each of those. So we start with the ISP layer uh, and this is what we, we talked about is the modem. Uh, usually uh, comes in, in, you know, in a, in a separate box. Really when it comes to modems, you have three options. Either you replace or you bridge or you DMZ. Um, the replace option is our preferred method, and this is something that we recommend to all dealers if possible. Whenever possible, swap out that modem that comes from the ISP with the modem that you own. Uh, so this way you can get the higher quality modem uh, and you can guarantee its performance and you own it. Um, when, what we saw is that for cable modems, for example, so we are, we are here in the North Carolina area, um, or even in the Midwest when Spectrum, Time Warner, or Comcast, um, it's really preferred to swap those cable modems with something that you can buy off of Amazon. Uh, and Aris uh, Surfboard is a, a really good modem, very reliable. Uh, it needs to rebooting every once in a while, but overall it's much better than what you get from the uh, ISP. Um, and also, the way you can sell on the customer is that almost all those ISPs, when they put their modem uh, in the, the house, now they're moving towards a recurring cost, or they call it a maintenance fee, uh, so they can uh, maintain it and do some firmware updates on it, and they charge the customer about 6 to $8 a month in order to maintain it. So that's a perpetual cost for the end customer, so replacing this modem with one time $110 or $150 modem, it will pay its, uh, for itself within a year and a half to two years tops. Um, so that's something that's very important and we refer, uh, prefer this method. But we recognize that sometimes you cannot um, replace that modem because it comes in a combo. So the modem is embedded in a router combo and there's Wi-Fi in, in, in that, so it makes it a lot worse. Uh, and a lot more tricky to to uh, to replace. So what you will do uh, in that case, if you if there's no way to replace it, your best second option is to bridge it. So keep the the modem or the combo uh, from the ISP and, and bridge it. Basically, it will act as a you know a pass through. Uh, so all you have to do is just make sure that you get the um, make and, and and model of that uh, that combo. Uh, call the ISP and tell them that you know uh, their their support staff and tell them that you want to bridge it. Uh, sometimes you know it's not fun to work with the ISP tech support, uh, so you might want to resort to you know do some quick online research in the manufacturer's manual because uh, most of the time these are uh, well-known companies um, and see how can you bridge that uh, modem combo and bypass it. If that combo has also Wi-Fi in it, it's advisable to turn off Wi-Fi in that device because usually it's not in an ideal place to have a Wi-Fi device in it. Uh, how you can verify with with this option is when you plug in the router uh, on the uh, inside that combo bridge, you should see a public WAN IP on the WAN interface of the router. Uh, so this is how you verify that this combo modem uh, is bridged. Now in the case, the third case, which is, you know, there's, you can't replace the modem, you have to deal with it, but for some reason uh, you cannot bridge it. You can't find the option. You called ISP and they said, you know, there's no way around it. You did some online research and they, you couldn't find anything to bridge it. Um, the third and final resort that we recommend to dealers is to put it on DMZ of that combo device. 
uh, and we've seen this with Verizon Fios. Um, the, the problem is that you have to be aware of double NAT situation. Basically, your, your, if you go here, the WAN interface of the router uh, is getting a private IP from that combo router. Uh, so basically, there's a, it's a mini router here in the, in the uh, cable, and it's having a private IP to the router, and it's getting a public IP from the ISP. So this is a NAT device, so it does network address translation from the WAN public IP to the LAN public uh, to the LAN IP. Then the router will do translation from this LAN IP to another LAN IP. So this is what we call a double NAT situation. The problem with a double NAT situation is that you have to, uh, if you are, if you want to do port forwarding, it becomes a little bit tedious because you have to do port forwarding on the first NAT device, then port forwarding on the second NAT device. The other problem is uh, if you want to do remote access to any of the devices inside the network, um, it becomes also problematic because they have to go through two layers of NATing. Um, now, with the uh, with Oversea Pro and Oversea Hub, uh, that problem doesn't exist because you SSH to Oversea Hub uh, inside the network and you can access um, other devices, local IP address or local interfaces easily. Uh, but if you do not have an Oversea Hub, um, remote access becomes a little bit tricky, and it requires some maneuvering in the both the combo from the ISP and the router. So these are the three options that you have. Um, we have some internal documents in our tech support for uh, DMZing, uh, and if you run into that situation, uh, feel free to call our support uh, line, and they, we will help you through it. Now the gateway layer, um, which is the router. Uh, so basically the router, uh, what it does is it connects the internal network with the internet. So let's assume that this is the modem that you got and you replaced. All it does is uh, it's just a dumb device. Your router is getting a WAN IP address from the ISP and the router is responsible for all that translation from inside to outside the network. So here are some general tips uh, and tricks that you need to be aware of uh, when you think about that layer, the gateway layer. Uh, make sure you look at the, you spec the right equipment, look at the WAN to LAN throughput. Uh, our current 300 series router is uh, capable of doing up to 500 megabit per second WAN to LAN. Uh, I know some of the you know higher uh, high you know, frequency questions that I get is like, hey, are you going to come up with a higher end router to do uh, one gigabit per second for those Google fibers and the AT&T fibers? Um, ISPs, the answer is yes. Uh, we, are, we are in development, um, but uh, stay tuned for, for more information on that. Uh, the other thing that we start to see is that some of some of the dealers are more concerned about your security, um, and they we start to see some of those uh, unified threat management appliances uh, being specced as the gateway uh, device, uh, which is great. Uh, this is uh, those level of devices are higher than the typical uh, simple gateway in terms of just security. Uh, but you have to be very aware that once you enable all those security features, your throughput through that device goes way down. Um, so if you go to the spec sheet, uh, you have to look at the SSL IPS throughput. Uh, so this is um, basically the UTM device or the UTM appliance is doing deep packet inspection on encrypted traffic, which most of the you know, modern applications use encrypted traffic to communicate like Facebook. Um, so they, they have to do a lot of uh, processing uh, on the local device in order to to protect the traffic from, from any uh, malware or any attacks. Um, so what you typically see in a UTM appliance is that, for example, let's say they, they, you see a spec that is one gigabit per second firewall throughput. And you say, great, this is a great appliance. But paying extra attention to the spec sheet, you see the SSL IPS throughput is about 50 megabit per second. So there's a huge drop between not having security features and having security features. Uh, so just be aware this is, it's a good approach. Just be aware that you, know, you have to spec higher end equipment based on SSL IPS throughput. Uh, I think last time I checked with one of the dealers, he was uh, looking at a company called SonicWall. 
and he was trying to see if that if Sonic Wall will have a good uh, solution for his application. Um, and we looked at the highest end model from a low end series. Um, it dropped from 1.5 gigabit per second firewall to about 200 megabit per second SSL IPS throughput. And that equipment cost him on Amazon about $1,800. Um, so there is cost associated with a, high, with a UTM appliance. Uh, obviously, it's higher cost than non-UTM appliance. And there's also a performance uh, degradation problem that you need to be aware of. The other thing that you need to be aware of is, or we highly recommend, is that use one LAN interface to the core switch. So this is what we call the router on the stick um, architecture or design. So basically, it's the, the local network, uh, and you have the router sitting on one stick, which is one uh, interface to the, to the network. Uh, why we recommend this uh, architecture, uh, even though the router has, you know, most most of the time more than one interface uh, on the LAN side is because a lot of those routers are not meant to handle LAN traffic um, properly. Uh, so you, a lot of those routers do not have spanning tree configuration. A lot of them, they do not have IGMP configuration. Uh, there is, you know, LAN to LAN throughput. There are two ways to measure LAN to LAN throughput. One of them is layer two, which is only ethernet. The other one is layer three, which is IP routing. So if you have to do multiple VLANs and you have to do inter VLAN routing, your IP routing throughput through the router is not gigabit. Uh, so you have to be aware of those things when you connect multiple switches to the router directly. Uh, so that's why we highly recommend uh, doing router on a stick architecture. Um, the other thing that we recommend, for, since we're talking about routing, you talk about IP subnetting. Uh, so standardize on your own IP schema and document it. Uh, so this is a very, very important thing. It will make your life 100 times easier in the future. Um, so here's an example that I'm using. It's just an example. Um, first of all, stay away, or I would recommend to change the default 192.168.1 network because you end up with a lot of default network coming out of the box, maybe on the ISP combo box or when somebody's VPNing into the network. Uh, so it's highly advisable to change your default uh, subnet. So let's say I, I change my subnet to 192.168.100.x uh, it's a slash 24 subnet that will give me up to 254 IP addresses. There's plenty of devices that I can connect to this network. Um, so an example of standardizing on my own IP schema is I say, hey, every job that I go to, um, the range from dot one to dot 19 is reserved for networking equipment. So this is dot one is the router, dot two is the core switch, dot three is another switch, so on and so forth. So these are the management IP addresses for those networking, equi networking equipment. And I standardize on those across all my jobs. So if I have to remote access or I have to, uh, in you no know, local access, I don't have to waste time um, going through documentation or going through uh, some you know, previous notes on what the IP address of that device is. I know exactly what it is. It's always dot one for the router. It's always dot two for the core switch. It's always dot three for the uh, uh, the edge switch, and so on and so forth. Uh, here's another example from the IP schemas. Like I'm, I will start my surveillance equipment from dot 20 to dot 39. That gives me about 40 IP uh, IP surveillance equipment, uh, and I can say I always start with the MVR. So dot 20 is always the MVR. Dot 21 is the first IP camera. 22, 23, so on and so forth. So that makes it standardized, and that makes it also very, very easy to follow in troubleshooting. And once I've done a standardized on my own IP schema. I can also standardize on my port forwarding rule. So one of the very important items is that uh, we highly recommend matching port forwarding rules with IP addresses. So let's take an example of this surveillance um, sub, uh, IP schema here. So say between dot .20 and dot .39 are my IP cameras. And I want to access one of those cameras remotely through a, a port forwarding rule. Let's say I want to access you know, camera .30. Uh, so one of the best practices is that I start with a range of ports. Let's so say you know 8,000 is when I want where I start. Maybe I want to start at 9,000 on the WAN, 
uh, and match the last two digits with the IP address of the uh, of the device. Uh, so let's let me do a pen here real quick, so you can see it. This is 30 matches 30, um, and so on and so forth. So actually, it's the last three digits should match the last three digits here. So if I have a device here that's you know 130, then my port forwarding rule is 8130. I'm using keyboard. So that's that's an example of a really best practice. So this way, you know, when you want to remote access to a device, you don't have to even think about it. I, I know exactly. I'm starting always at port 8000 or port 9000, and I know my IP camera range start from 2021 20, all the way to 39. I know that I start, for example, north to south. I want to access the third camera from north, then it's going to be 23. Port 8023 80, uh, is the WAN I, or the port that I need to access. Saved me a lot of time and troubleshooting, just you know, plowing through documentation. The other you know, final tip uh, here is that, uh, oh, before final tip, is that VLANs, you have to consider about uh, inter-VLAN routing. Uh, some consideration when you have inter-VLAN uh, inter routing, and again, if you want to dive into the VLANs, please watch our uh, webinar about VLANs and read the documentation to support that. But one important thing that you need to be aware of is that Apple devices, sometimes control systems or streaming services, do not play well across VLANs. Uh, an example of that, if you have an Apple TV on one VLAN and you have uh, Apple devices like iPhones on another VLAN, your Apple uh, services will not go across VLAN. You cannot do AirPlay across VLANs. Uh, you cannot do AirPrint across VLANs. It's going to be very, very hard. Uh, and we found that some control systems, also, they don't scan across VLANs because they scan using MDNS uh, technology, and it doesn't play well across VLANs. So be very aware when you do VLANs. Um, about inter-VLAN routing and inter-VLAN traffic. Uh, the final tip when, when you talk about routers is when you do speed tests, uh, be aware that speedtest.net is not the only tool available for you. Uh, it is actually one of the least favorable uh, tools uh, that we recommend for, for dealers for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, it is flash-based, so it uh, if your computer is not up to speed in terms of spec, um, then your computer slows down the, the speed test. Uh, your NIC card will slow down the speed test. Um, the second reason for speedtest.net is the results vary by the test server. So make sure that you uh, pick or test against different servers, uh, servers in the region, uh, and you'll see different results there. Uh, a, a, Cool website it's called testmy.net is not flash based. It gives you uh, an average, an aggregate uh, about your service. I think this is something that's you know a good alternative to speedtest.net. All right, uh, let me clear these drawings. So we go to the core layer, uh, and as we say, the core layer, uh, we would our goal here is to make the network as quote unquote flat as possible which means that you want to minimize the number of hops between different uh, segments of the network. Um, so, like I said, for performance purposes, uh, for uh, for a lot of different reasons that we mentioned in the gateway layer, we would like to keep one core switch off of the router and then everything off of that core switch. It is not recommended to use multiple core switches off of the router. Um, you might end up using this architecture for really large jobs um, for various reasons, but if you are designing from the scratch, it's highly recommended to use one core switch off of the router. Your, if you use multiple switches off of the router, you run into issues with IGMP snooping on the router if it's not supported, spanning tree issues if it's not supported on the router, your layer three traffic uh, land to land is, is going to be less than gigabit per second. Uh, so it's really not a good situation. 
So like I said, um, make your network as flat as possible. Make it as a hub and spoke topology like we talked to. So everything is fed off that core switch. Uh, and in this layer, actually, a managed switch is better than an unmanaged switch uh, for various reasons. And, and if you watch the Spanning Tree and Sonos uh, webinar, um, we explained that, you know, the in, in, when using managed switches, you can control the Spanning Tree uh, algorithm. And you want your core switch to be the root bridge for spanning tree. So you you want to force the, the network to get all, all the traffic through the core switch, not through Sonos. Uh, here makes sense, and it's better than an unmanaged switch. And if you have access points uh, in this scenario, I think a lot of the jobs will have access points. It is also recommended to use a managed PoE switch, and that's this is one of the reasons that we do not have an unmanaged PoE device is because we would like to keep that control in a managed platform. Uh, the other thing you need to think about from a design perspective is you want to keep your hops, this is the jumps, so if you if your traffic goes from the switch to the router, this is one hop. You want to keep it to three to five hops maximum from end to end. Uh, usually dealers don't think about it from device to device, they think about it from device to the internet. It's like, hey, I got three or four hops between my device to the internet, um, this is good for the internet traffic, but what about traffic going from a control touch panel to the control processor? That needs to be between three to five hops maximum in a good design. So that's why you have a flat network. Um, we uh, also recommend from a physical installation to color code different types of traffic if possible and standardize on that. Um, like I said, if you have access points, use a PoE switch in the core uh, as a core switch and make sure you pay attention to the PoE power budget. So an example for our switches, a 210 has half PoE power budget as a 310. Um, so it depends on the number of, of access points in the job and depends on the number of PoE devices in the job. You might wanna you know, select a 210 versus a 310. Uh, like I said, from a spanning tree perspective, especially when you deal with Sonos, and we've seen lately some TVs actually, they have some spanning tree problems, a Samsung TV and a Sony TV we ran into, uh, a core switch needs to be the spanning tree root bridge. Um, and when you have really large uh, jobs, you need to start thinking about VLANing those chatty traffic. So if you have you know, a surveillance system, make, you know, it would, I would start with surveillance in separate VLAN to begin with. Make sure you name interfaces on that core device, on the core switch. It will save your life when you go six months, eight months after after the, the fact and you want to troubleshoot something. This is when, you know, oversee as a cloud management, free cloud management tool is very valuable for you. It will take a couple of minutes of your time to go through oversee and name each interface. Uh, say, you know, interface one is connected to access point you know, upstairs, interface number seven is connected to access point basement. Um, that will help your life a lot. Now we go to the access layer. So the access layer is the layer uh, or, or the building blocks from the solution that interfaces with your end devices. So that's, that's an interface with your control touch panels, with your Sonos devices, with your TVs with your uh, end clients, uh, so when they have their laptops or mobile phones. Uh, so there is a, a wired uh, component and there's a wireless component. Uh, and like I said in the in a previous webinar, uh, the last webinar we've done uh, on the truth about Wi-Fi speed, and this is something we also documented in, in a blog, if you go to our blog, um, there is a big difference between the advertised speed on any networking manufacturer access point and what you should expect in real life. Um, so an example, you know, a 700 series access point that we have, or any equivalent uh, access point that we have, uh, will have about, we'll, we'll advertise 1750 megabit per second. Uh, the nominal throughput will be around um, 800 megabit per second. The effective throughput in real life based on a lot of variables that you cannot control ahead of time uh, will be between two to four or 500 megabit per second. So there's a big gap between the two. Uh, unfortunately, that's the nature of Wi-Fi. That's the nature of the standard. There's no special sauce between any different uh, vendors for that. Um, 
So make sure that you understand those limitations and make sure that you set the expectations right with your customers. Um, so from the access uh, you know, layer perspective, the unmatched switches here, is, uh, are, they make sense from a cost effectiveness and just ease of deployment. Um, and I would account for 20 to 30% port expansion in the future for any access switch, unless it's a really special case. Uh, so if you have um, a PoE switch, for example, as an access switch, and you have you know, a requirement of eight cameras or seven cameras, um, I would not get an, an eight port PoE switch. I would get a 16 port PoE switch just to make sure that in the future expansion, uh, you are covered. The, it's really hard for the customer to come back, you know, a year from 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 the job, ask for one or two, ask, you know, IP cameras to be added, and you come up with a quote that you need to swap your switch, and it's a couple hundred dollars extra. Uh, so plan for it as expansion. Sometimes, you know, we we understand that you need to be on a budget, on a tight budget. Uh, so just make sure that you account for that. Um, when it comes to wireless. Uh, um, and it's something you know, we stress with our customers that dual band APs, so 2.4 and 5 gigahertz APs, much more important uh, than any cost effectiveness. So I would start with a 300 series access point at the very minimum. Uh, it's a dual band 2.4 and 5. The 2.4 gigahertz spectrum is a lost cause. It's really, really hard to get any meaningful throughput out of it, and it's getting even more scrutiny from the FCC. Uh, um, if you want to plan for the future, wireless AC is definitely the mainstream now. Wireless N is an old technology. If you want to do analogy for uh, video traffic, wireless AC is the 4K, wireless N is 1080p. Um, use fixed Wi-Fi channels. So all the access points are auto in terms of channel selection. This is when you your investment in a spectrum analyzer is very important uh, because if you do your job and you do spectrum analysis and you do site survey on that job, you will pick the right Wi-Fi channel for each radio interface that will have less interference. And you know what you're getting into. You will not rely on any external factors for that. And if you know six months from the from the fact uh, the customer calls. You say, hey, my Wi-Fi is slowing down. You can quickly do another Wi-Fi uh, spectrum analysis and see what happened to that channel, and you can jump on a different channel. Uh, heat map uh, for fine-tuning, and this is when your investment in heat mapping software will be uh, very important to set the expectations right, make sure that you don't have any dead spots in the Wi-Fi coverage, make sure you measure the uh, speed. So this, these tools will measure the speeds that distance and will get you, you know, you get a really nice report for your customer to see what the expectations are. Um, name the interfaces. This is even more important to name interfaces than the core layer uh, because this is where you connect your Apple TVs, where you connect your touch panels. So naming the interfaces is very, very important at this layer. And this is really the genesis of our 110 Unmatched Plus uh, solution. This is why we believe our 110 series switches are imperiled in the market uh, because you can do uh, basic management features through Oversee. You can name those interfaces through Oversee uh, rather than getting a dumb switch that you cannot name. Uh, so this is what, what sets this the 110 series solution apart from everybody else in the market. Uh, very, very, very important is to name the cables and test them. Uh, I can't tell you how many times we get calls from dealers thinking that the port is problematic in the switch. It turns out to be the termination is not good or there's something happened in the cable is not tested or is cut off. Uh, your cable infrastructure is the backbone that runs everything. Uh, uh, so if your cable is good, your network is good. Now we'll shift the conversation since we have that you know, framework from a design perspective. Uh, when you sit down with your customer uh, and you want to design a solution for them, you, you need to flip this uh, model framework um, upside down. So your conversation with the customer should start with the devices. Uh, and the devices you should ask like, hey, how many, you know, how many, you know, family household or how many members that, uh, how many people that will be at that, uh, in that location, how many wireless devices in total or on average, how many wired devices they will have have on average, you will add a lot of devices on the network from other solutions like your AV solution or your thermostats and what have you. 
um, what services are needed. Uh, if they want to stream music, they want to do some surveillance, you have some control systems, some lighting control. Uh, this, these are the normal uh, steps that you go through with your, uh, with your customers. But as you go through them, you start to map out in your head what that network architecture should look like. Um, you do, do, I would highly recommend to do a quick site survey of the floor plan and do some initial wireless design to determine how many access points you need and when you want, where you want to uh, place them. Uh, understand what kind of ISPs are in the region, uh, what kind of bandwidth they want to get from that ISP. Um, and then, like I said, set, set the expectations about the Wi-Fi speeds based on our webinar. They will not get, you will never get one gigabit per second Wi-Fi throughout the house. That is not going to happen within the existing standards, no matter what other vendors tell you. Um, explain the higher end, uh, the need for higher end networks. Uh, unfortunately, we still see, hear from dealers that there is a pushback around the quote for networking in a higher end job. Um, it is very important for you as you under, uh, as you face uh, these challenges every day because the network is the backbone of the solution. And if you don't own it and it's not up to speed in terms of performance and reliability, then the end user experience is not going to be as good. Uh, then you do your design and you quote it and hopefully you win the job. So this is what we think are general steps or general tips that you need to uh, take into consideration when you sit down with the customer trying to design a job or quote a job for them. Now, before we turn into the uh, Q&A uh, session, uh, we'll get to the product announcement uh, phase of, of the presentation. Uh, we're super excited about uh, the outdoor access point that we launched last week. Um, Lots of great uh, feedback, a lot of uh, excitement, and, and we see it in the, in the sales numbers. Um, today, I'm going to announce uh, a product that we release next week. Um, so when we sat down and thought about those use cases that, from a networking architecture perspective, uh, we see or we hear uh, from the dealers that a lot of time they put their switches, especially those access switches, either behind the TV, and this one, you know, a Versa box will come into play, uh, or they will have a structure wiring can in the job, and they want just to loop in and out that structure wiring can into the centralized rack, or they put it on the shelf, uh, so they, they have, you know, a shelf in the rack, and they have a small device like a Roku. They would like to keep put another div uh, switch right next to it to save some space in the rack. So this is why we developed the new uh, 110 compact series line. So this is an expansion on the existing 110 series switches. Um, so it comes because it's 110, it's uh, unmanaged plus, so it's full gigabit on the back plane, it's cloud managed through oversee. Like I said, there's nothing like it in the market. Uh, it is very compact in design, um, and I will speak next on the, on what are the benefits for that compact design. They are powered by PoE, so that's very exciting from an architecture perspective. When you have a core switch that is a PoE and you have a TV location and you want to put a five port that is powered by PoE, and there is a PoE out. So whether it's powered by DC or powered by PoE, the PoE out is 15 watts. Uh, so let's go quickly through the features. So Unmanaged Plus, like I said, it's an unmanaged switch, but cloud managed through oversee. So it, it's DHCP out of the box. It grabs an IP talks to oversee. Uh, what do you get in an unmanaged switch is you see devices online, offline. You can see the switches of offline or it's online. Uh, you can name the switch. You can name individual ports. Uh, and you can see the speed and duplex on each port. Uh, you can do firmware updates remotely if we do any firmware releases. And you can reboot the entire switch remotely. Uh, so we cannot, uh, we couldn't get to reboot the individual PoE out but you can reboot the entire switch uh, and that by default reboots the PoE. Um, so like I said, the compact design, it's very, very important. So we went into this product uh, design from the mindset of uh, let's design a product to go into a structure wiring can or, or into Versa box. So you can see it comes in five, eight or 16 port option. Uh, they come with the mounting gear uh, included in the box. There's no DC, DC power supply. Um, but you can see it mounts very neatly, very nicely into the structure wiring can, and you can put it here if you use our WirePath 1 uh, 
cans, you can mount it on the platform. Um, we've seen dealers during beta tests that they do uh, mounting on the side of the rack sometimes, and they do it under the desk. And uh, I'm pretty sure you guys find a lot of innovative ways to install this product. Uh, like I said, it's PoE in, so it's 30 watts in, and there's 15 watts out. Uh, it can be powered by either PoE switch or PoE injector um, or a DC power supply. The DC power supply is sold separately. It's 48 volt. Um, but when you power through uh, 15 or 30 watts, uh, it's, uh, it's 15 watts only. PoE out, uh, so you can power... Uh, another localized device like an IP camera or a wireless access point, or you can power actually another uh, compact switch from another switch by PoE. Um, but be aware that the PoE out uh, when powered by PoE is limited to 50 meters in terms of distance. That's about 150 feet. So that's it. That's the announcement. Uh, it's compact series. It's really uh, our design process to go into the custom uh, installation. Uh, listen to your pain points and design a product around those pain points and give you a really valuable solution. Um, and with that being said, uh, I'll leave it to Ricky so we can go through some questions. All righty, Aham. As always, um, great information on networking. Um, we're going to go through a few questions here. I think most of these, everyone could get a little bit of uh, a good uh, answers on some of these. Uh, um, most of these we did cover, but I think some of them are pretty important that we uh, we maybe cover again. I'll start with this last one. We just talked about the PoE uh, capabilities of these compact switches, and, and one of the questions, Aham, is, is this PoE plus device, or will it only pull 14.5 watts? So I think you covered that but why don't you go in a little bit more on that? Uh, it's a good question. Um, so it is both. It depends really. So the switch itself, it pulls up to 12 watts uh, of power. But when you power, when you utilize the PoE out, so if, you, if you're not utilizing the PoE out interface, uh, then it's only PoE. Uh, if you start to pull power, from that PoE out interface now it becomes a PoE plus N. So 30 watts in, 12 watts consumed in the device, and 15 watts out, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, let's go into some general questions here. And, and a lot of these, you actually answered some of these, but again, I, I want to reiterate some of these questions. I think they're, they're key for the networking guys. Do you need a core switch if you only have one access switch? Great question. No. Uh, in that case, when you have a really small job, um, and really small means that you can have up to 48 devices on a one switch that can act as a core and access switches at the same time, you do not need a, a core switch. This is really more of an expandable and scalable architecture uh, when you have those larger jobs. But let's say if I have a small to medium-sized job that I got, you know, up to 48 devices only. They need no VLANing or they need just to be plugged into one device. Then you can get a router and from the router to a 48 port switch and then from the 48 port switches all the way to end devices. That's very feasible. Okay. You may have to pull up one of your other slides for this one, but uh, I think it's key. Please discuss the location of the Oversea Hub and why you would play. Oh, great question. Great, great question. Uh, let me go back um, to my architecture one real quick. Oh, here you go. Um, so, great question. Your Oversea Hub, um, since it's measuring speed and latency, ideally what you want to do is plug that Oversea Hub directly into the router. This is the best place to put the hub because it will go only one hop to the internet and also it will be on the top of the network to scan the entire network. Um, we are, so today, if you put today the Oversea hub to the router, our existing 300 series router, you will see there's a significant dip into the reported speed. And that's a bug that we are fixing in a firmware update for the router that will be scheduled to be released by the end of the month. 
so in a couple of weeks, we will release a new firmware for the router. It's 1.0.5.34. Um, and that will fix that issue, and you'll put the hub. Your next best option today is to put the hub into the core switch. Again, you want to have as accurate of speed as a measurement as possible, and you want to have as, ac as good of access to the entire network as possible. So that's a good question. Okay, again, I think we covered some of this, but I just want to make sure that everyone understands. If there are only two switches on a network, are you saying we should have the layers stacked, one off the router and the other off the other switch? It depends on on your architecture, but ideally, yes. You do not want to have two switches off the router because you, like I said, uh, you will end up with a situation uh, where you have, let me go to this slide, when you have traffic going, if you have traffic going between those two switches, they will go through the router, and now you will have spanning tree issues, you will have IGMP issues. Um, if you have any inter-VLAN routing between the two, you will have performance degradation for sure. Um, so ideally, you want them to be uh, one off the other, one as a core, one as the axis. All right, so again, lots of questions about that. So just everyone, so everyone's clear is that there should be one core switch and then other switches uh, plugged into the core switch. Um, so when you're designing your system, that's why it's so important to understand how many network connections you need to have uh, to how many devices. So um, another quick question here, uh, this is just a general question. What IP finder tool do you recommend for Windows computer? Any recommendations on that? Um, Good question. So we got a, you know, a couple of options. Uh, some of them are free. So if you are using uh, Wi-Fi uh, on the phone, I'm a big fan of Fing. Um, Fing is a really good tool. Um, if you are using, obviously, our OverC Hub, our OverC Hub utilizes multiple tools uh, inside the, the code uh, to sniff uh, the entire network and puts everything into your OverC dashboard. Uh, if you just wanted something that is uh, software uh, on the PC, I think uh, for Windows, there's a Windows uh, IP scanner, if I, if I recall that correctly. All right, just a couple of more questions real quick. Uh, this one's on the compact switch. How small are these, and do they need any airspace? Uh, they're quite small, uh, so you can see them. The they are uh, on the website as coming soon items. Um, just filter on the left side, uh, unmanaged plus, and you'll see them as coming soon. Uh, they're quite compact. Do uh, you need some airspace uh, going uh, just because they're fanless? They don't have any fans, so you need some ventilation going through the switch. Um, but uh, like for example, we 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 during the design process we. Uh, we thought that would be a good idea to do a drop-in uh, installation in the VersaBox, similar to the WAP box. But unfortunately, that tight space is not recommended uh, by the certification bodies because of, you know, uh, air circulation, the risk of running too hot and, and catching fire. So that you do not want that to happen. So uh, make sure there's a good amount of space around them and for... All righty, uh, another quick question. Can you talk a little bit about the proper use of the SFP ports? Oh, restored. Can you hear me now? Sorry, I lost my connection for some reason. Uh, so the SFP port, so 210 and 310 switches that we have, there are uh, at minimum two SFP ports and a maximum four SFP ports when you have 48 port models. Uh, so those SFP ports, they are extra ports on the switch. They do not share any backplane with uh, other ports. So they have dedicated bandwidth. So really an eight port is a 10 port. Um, but when it comes to 
SFP ports. There are really two use cases that we recommend that we see dealers use that for. So the SFP port, think about it as an empty slot that you can populate with either electrical RG45 or a fiber SFP. Um, so let's talk about the electrical RG45. If you have, let's take this example. We have a, a job when we got, you know, a 210, 16 PoE and 15 or 16 of those uh, PoE interfaces need to power 16 IP cameras. You still need the one interface to go back to the core switch. So that interface, it's, you have two options. Either you lose a PoE port or you get a RJ45 SFP and plug that RJ45 SFP and connect it to the core switch and now you have 16 PoE ports going to 16 IP cameras. Um, cause, so that's a main use case. The other use case is think about, for example, if this five port or this, you know, instead of the five port here, there's a you know eight port 210 and it is in a guest house, but is really far. It's like 200 meters far or 300 meters far. Uh, your, RG, your Cat5 from an ethernet perspective can go up to 100 meter tops per standard. So that is 350 feet. Uh, if you want to go beyond that, you need to go fiber. Uh, so if you will have to go fiber interface, uh, then you would populate a fiber interface on the switch in the, in the access switch and a fiber uh, interface on the core switch. And now you have a fiber link between the two switches. All right, we're about to run out of time here. I got one more question here. I think it's pretty relevant. Um, we didn't talk a lot about the brand new outdoor wireless access point, uh, so this question could come into play here. Also, by the way, on the on the wireless access, the new outdoor wireless access point, there's some really good videos uh, on that product tab that you might want to take a look at. But this question just came in: Can I just add your new outdoor wireless access point to a customer's existing network? So I think, Aham, you should probably talk a little bit about the power requirements and things for that. Yeah, the, the quick answer is yes. Um, from from for the outdoor access point, it's a 700 series outdoor access point. It has almost the same software features as the indoor 700 series outdoor access point. It means that you get dual band concurrent uh, 2.4 and 5. You get uh, 1750 wireless AC with 3x3 antenna. Uh, and in that support tab video, uh, we talk about, you know, it has the same band steering, it, it has the same fast roaming features, so it will work seamlessly, it's overseen enabled. Um, the one uh, caveat or the one thing that we did from a design perspective, um, it's because it's an outdoor product, um, outdoors, in the outdoors, signal travel really far. Uh, because there's less obstruction, there's less uh, interference, or not, there's more interference, but less obstruction. So it doesn't degrade that much. Uh, so what we found in testing is that, you know, you will be sitting uh, 400 to 500 feet away from the access point. Your phone will get two bars of Wi-Fi coverage, sometimes three bars, because it travels really far from the access point. But your phone or your tablet is limited in its output power. So think about it as its mini access point. There's a radio inside that phone that needs to transmit power. So the maximum power for that phone is 22 dBm. Um, and when you have a really high powered access point that's reaching really far uh, and the, that signal strength coming from the phone back to the access point is not as high, then you end up with two bars of Wi-Fi but you're spinning because your signal, you cannot talk back to the access point. So what we've done with the outdoor um, is that we tune down the power of that product to be maximum 22 dBm. So at the very least, it matches those devices in terms of output power. And now you get a better performance, uh, effective performance. So you not might get uh, as much coverage, but you, at one point, you end up with a lot of garbage coverage or that, you know, you get a lot of coverage, but you can't talk back. Uh, so that's what we've done with the outdoor uh, product. But from a installability perspective and from an architecture perspective, it's really plug and play. It will be another access device on your access um, layer. 
All righty. That's about as much time as we have for today. There are quite a few other questions that have come in. And, of course, like always, we'll pass this on to AHAM's group. And those guys usually follow up within a day or two on answering any questions that we didn't have time to cover. I do want to add one little bit of information, uh, a personal part of information to this, is that every time I sit in one of these webinars and host these for, for AHAM, I, I learn tons and tons of things that I did not know about network and I'm sure the same is with you guys. I do want to give you one other bit of advice is that we did a previous webinar called uh, the truth about Wi-Fi speeds and probably it is my most requested link that I get via email as guys say hey man I'd, I want to look at that thing again could you send me the link so I've got to give you guys this advice go to our website Go to our product pages, log in with your username and ID, uh, go to any of the access points, any of our access points, and you'll see a video under the support tab called The Truth About Wi-Fi Speeds. And AHAM did an excellent job of being able to explain exactly what you can expect with Wi-Fi uh, technology. I think if you take that webinar, you'll be able to speak to your customers in a really easy to understand way. Uh, to explain to that customer why they're not getting the posted speed of what they might be expecting. It also gives you the ability to understand fully on how to properly design a true Wi-Fi network. So again, a little bit of advice. Please uh, take the time when you, when you do have some time to uh, take a look at that webinar. Again, it's on the product pages, on the access points, under the support tab. Look on the videos, the truth about Wi-Fi speeds. Um, again, thanks, Aham, for another great webinar. Um, we are going to follow up this in a day or two. Probably Monday or Tuesday, you'll get an a email follow-up. Um, it's going to have the coupon code uh, for the offer that we sent you in the uh, invite. And we're also going to put a link to this recording session. It takes us a day or two to process it and get it posted. So look for this on Monday or Tuesday of next week for that follow-up email. Uh, also, as, as a follow-up, please take a, a brief minute to uh, fill out our survey on the exit of the webinar and let us know what you thought of today's presentation and what other webinar topics you're interested in. Um, on behalf of AHAM and Arachnus Networking Products and Snap AV, we thank you for taking the time to join us today. Have a great day and happy installing.